Has anybody felt a stirring to rise up, to get out of the complacency, to get out of the just get by street, to get out of, you know, just letting it, just making it, or just turning the other cheek or whatever it might be, but to become what God wants us to become and to be the church triumphant, the church victorious, ruling and reigning with Christ on this planet. Amen? So to do that, I believe there's a stirring, and I honestly believe that there is a stirring of the deep, deep wells within us. I want us to realize today that everything that we need, God has already given us. Everything that is needed to, to, to do what God has called us to do is already in us now. It may be laying dormant. It may be, be put aside or something like that through different circumstances. But I believe the Holy Ghost is going to stir again those deep, deep wells on the inside of us. We're going to stand up. We're going to hear that prophetic word. I want to tell you there's something about the prophetic word that as it comes out with the anointing on it, the prophetic word, when it's, it's powerful and it goes through the, the realm of the, of the atmosphere like a hot uh, knife goes through butter. It cuts into the realm of the spirit. It opens up something. It pushes back things. It breaks open stuff. Do you believe that today? You see, Jesus, you know, and God, when he spoke, he said, let there be light. And as he spoke that prophetic word, because there was no light at that particular time, God calls those things that be not as though they were. And he spoke that word into that atmosphere. And as he spoke that word, the creative power of God got hold of that word and started to create what God said was going to happen. And I believe that, that you and I, as we stand in the realm of the Spirit, as we stand in the office and as we stand as born-again believers, Spirit-filled, that our words and our voice are so powerful, it's time to activate and, and speak into the realm of the Spirit and believe for something to happen. Amen. You catch my drift this morning. And, and I believe that there's got to come a stirring. There's got to come a, a challenge perhaps to us. The sleeping giant called the church is awakened by the fire. I, be, I believe, you know, the disciples, they were, they were there in, a, in, a, in an upper room. They were praying. They were seeking God. And, and they were scared stiff, to be honest with you. But something happened. A sound came from heaven, the mighty Holy Spirit. And it came upon them and it activated what was already on the inside of them. The Spirit of God touched something on the inside of them. They were, they were endured with power from on high. They stood in their office. They stood in their place. And Peter now, full of the Holy Ghost, stands up and he rebukes the crowd. And he says, they are not drunk with wine as you suppose, but this is what was spoken or prophesied some 200 or 300 years ago by the prophet Joel. And, and he started to speak what God was going to do about an outpouring of the Spirit. And I want to tell you, we were talking on Thursday night about a, a former rain and a latter rain. The former rain was back there, but how many people know that there's a latter rain revival that's coming to the church today? Get ready for the latter rain. Don't put your raincoat on. <laughs> Allow it to get all over you and get inside you and stir you up again. I don't know about you, but I'm a little bit stirred today. Amen. Is it okay to get a bit excited? Is it all right to be happy with Jesus and know that, that God has got a plan for our lives and it's exciting? Because I want to tell you, I believe that that's what's happening. I, I believe last week we opened a truth that, that challenged how we respond to things that happen to us as we walk through life with Jesus. I, I believe that as we're walking through life, certain things happen. It's how we react. Uh, uh, you know, some think, and they're also told that when you get saved and born again, you will never have another problem. <laughs> mm, glory to God. I, I wish that's the way it was. That would be nice, but it's not my experience. Anybody else's experience like that? You know, but God wants us to overcome and triumph over the enemy in it. Amen. We're not going to be put off by what happens or what goes on. We're, instead, we're going to be encouraged by it. We're going, to, we're going to allow the Spirit of God to do a work in our lives. And, and I think that that's very, 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 very exciting. It's what I do. Uh, you know, it's not what I, all these experiences, but it's, it's how I react. Some people, you know, it's, we go through things, but what, this is what I know. How many people know some stuff? <laughs> This is what I know. In Isaiah 54, verse 17, it says, No weapon formed against me will prosper. You believe that? Yes. Say that to your neighbor. No weapon formed against me will prosper. No weapon can prosper. 
And in Revelation 3.21, it says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me upon my throne, even as I have overcome and am seated upon my father's throne. I believe that, that you know, God uh, destroyed the enemy. I, I believe that God's made a way for us. And, you know, in John 14, 12, Jesus said, if you believe in him, the works that Jesus did, we can do also. So if Jesus overcame, that means that we can overcome. Is that okay? See, what, what I've got to do is instead of being overcome, I've got to realize to him who overcomes, and Jesus wants me to overcome. He wants me to triumph over every trial, everything that comes my way, every affliction, whatever it might be, so that I can win like he won. 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 <laughs> That's a new word. I, 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 I don't play Scrabble with me because I find new words all the time. It's how we look at things. If you remember, uh, we were reading uh, last week, and I want to do it again. Read, have a look with me in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. It says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. Our afflictions are supposed to work for us, not against us. We sometimes allow afflictions to drive us away from the things of God. But really, we should say, this thing is working for me. What can I learn from this? What, what, can, I, what can I get out of this? For these light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, around about us is a supernatural realm, a supernatural place where God has got miracles and goodness knows what, that if we can bypass what we see in the natural and grab hold of the things that are in the realm of the Spirit and bring them down over our lives, we're going to find the victory that we need to have. Amen. The Bible says that God has given us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. Is that correct? So there's no lack. There should be no lack in the church. There should be no lack in us. Uh, I, I believe that the effectual, uh, a fervent, sorry, prayer will, will avail much. Afflictions uh, reveal to us our attitude and where we're at. They show us what's going on. So I believe that we need to deal with some things. Are we ready? We want to deal with some stuff. I, I want to deal with stuff. I, I, I just said to Kendall, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in a... I'm in a repenting mood, amen? I want to repent all the time. I want to get, how many people want to get right with God? I, I, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will hear them. I'll answer. I can't remember the, all of it. But, you know, you, how many people know that? I will, what? I will heal their land. I was getting to that bit. <laughs> I will deliver them. I'll set them free. If my people... And I want to say today, a lot of things that we're praying for and everything like that, and we wonder why it's not happening, it's if my people, if we, if we respond to God, if we respond the way God wants us to respond, if we, if we do it God's way, well, then I believe that God will do everything that he wants. There's some things that we need to face. There's some things we need to drive out. And I spoke these last week, but I just want to speak again. I want to share them again. Injustice. Anybody ever had injustice? Uh, intimidation, fear of death, fear or failure, uh, sickness and diseases, depression and, and, and despair, uh, satanic oppression, double-mindedness, debt, shame, disappointment, betrayal, uh, financial barriers, persecutions, self-doubt, insecurities, despair, family tragedies, low self-esteem, discouragement, uh, rejection, divorce, guilt, or slander. All these things have an effect on us. Injustice is something that's a very horrible thing. You know, when injustice comes, uh, you know, when this thing comes, it's desire. See, all these things have a desire. 
They, they want to do something to your life. When, when you go through stuff, they, they want to do something to you. And its desire is to bring you into a place of unforgiveness. And yet God wants us to, the word simply says, uh, forgive those or bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That's in Romans 12 verse 14. Don't let the enemy triumph over us in what he's trying to do to us. Rise up above him. Get excited. They persecuted Jesus. Perhaps if you're getting persecuted, you're doing something right. You thought of that? <laughs> he forgave them to a point that he even died for them. To set them free. And I praise God that he died for me as well. These afflictions are working for us. Uh, let us deal with some things. Why? Why do we need to deal with things? Why do we do that? When we get ourselves together, I believe, when, when, when we get right with God, when, when, when we allow the Spirit of, of God to, or the Holy Spirit or whatever, just to come upon our lives and bring conviction upon us, when we're in worship sometimes or just as you're reading the Word or whatever it might be, sometimes in a meeting like this, where the presence of God just starts to get around our lives and starts speaking to us. And, and there's areas in our lives. You see, I believe that the body of Christ, God is going to start to shake us. He's going to start to do a work in our lives. He's going to bring us to a place of righteousness. Although it's a free gift, there's, there's things there that are unrighteous in our lives that God wants to clean out. He wants to set us free because when He does that, he, we're going to find that God will add daily to the church those that should be saved. Can I, can I say this? You see, there's some certain things that God wants to do. God' desire is that none would perish. Is that correct? But I believe that the church universal, because I don't know about you, but the church really is in a bit of a mess at the moment. And I'm not being critical. I'm not, we're, we're just as bad. How many people know that God's got to do a bit of work in us? Come on, let's tell the truth and shame the devil. <laughs> and we're not perfect. We do silly things too. We gossip, we whinge, we complain. We do this, we do that. We, we do stuff that we shouldn't do. But I, I believe that when, when, we do, when we get right, when, when, we, when, when we start to repent, when, when we find our place in the body of Christ, I, I believe that then God can bring about revival. I, I believe that this latter rain will start to be poured out upon the church. You know, what, what, we, we as a church, I don't know what we are. We could, be a, we could be a big toe, but we're part of a body. Do you believe that? Yeah. To be honest with you, I think we're a mouth. <laughs> the Bible says this, I don't want you to be aware of Satan's cunning devices. I don't want you to be unaware but be aware and deal with issues that the enemy puts down. We've got to cast off restraint. We've got to cast off weights that get around us. The children of God, and if you'd like to have a look with me in the book of Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, very, very, we, we know these scriptures off by heart, but it's good to read them again. It's good to, I'd recommend that you read this whole story again. And this is a story of the children of God that have been, they've been in bondage, they've been in captivity, They're, the taskmasters were, were terrible, they were, uh, it was just a horrible place to be. And God came on the scene and, and touched Moses and sent him in there to the Pharaoh. God said, set my people free and let them go. We know that when God spoke, it didn't get better, it got worse for a period of time. But then God started to miraculously, everybody say miraculously. Can I, can I say this? When God starts to move, it's not just going to be a good idea. It's not just going to be because you've got great music or because you've got a great this or you've got a great facility or because you've got swings in the children's playground or because you've got good cappuccinos or because you've got that. When God starts to move, it's not going to be anything of the flesh. When God starts to do his thing in this time that you and I live in, it's going to come out of the supernatural power of God. God doesn't want, because otherwise we'll think we did it ourselves. God wants to show himself strong and he's going to move supernaturally with, a, with an amazing manifestation of his power, of his victory, of his healing, of his deliverance, of, of, of whatever you can think in your imagination. God is going to move sovereignly. It's going to be a power of God. 
And we know there that, that the Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. And we know all the problems there, but God sent the plagues and different things and eventually the death angel. And it came to a point, okay, out they go. They didn't go bankrupt. They went and they plundered Egypt, the Bible says. They come out of Egypt and they're rejoicing. They're, they come to the place where they're about to go in and take the promises of God. And you know, one of the things I've met, found with many Christians, we come to a place where we're saved, where we're delivered, where we've been filled with the Spirit, where God's blessing comes upon us. We're rejoicing and we're excited and everything's wonderful. And we come to the place where God says, now I want you to cross over and I want you to come into something of my anointing and something of my blessing and something of my provision and I want you to, to, to come into the promises that I've given to you because it's good dancing around out here with all the fairies but I want to tell you we're not here just to be a dancer we're here to become an army to become a victorious people that are going to go back in and drive out the enemies that have that have plundered the children of God and plundered the church we're not here just to, to listen to messages every Sunday we're not here just to, to sing some nice songs or even have a time of worship, which is wonderful. I believe that's where we get restored, where we got built up. But we don't, that, that's not the end. That's not the fulfillment. That's just the beginning. As you walk out these doors, you're entering into your mission field. You don't have to go to India. Praise God, you can go to India if you like and go wherever you like. But I want to tell you, your mission field is just as much three foot outside of that door as anywhere else. God wants to do, I believe, amazing things. And so here we find the children of Israel and they go in to spy out the land. The Bible says there in 17 that Moses sent the spies in to spy out the land. We're going to pick up the story from verse 27. Okay, verse 27. And they told him and said, we went, this is after they came back. They, then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. In other words, it's saying it truly flows with an abundance of food. It flows with an abundance of provision. It flows with milk. It just wasn't, friends, people looking for the milk and the honey. No, <laughs> this was just a phrase. It flows with the abundance of, of provision that they needed. And this is the fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. You know what we've got to be careful of is the neverthelesses that get around our lives. Because the promise of God is yea and amen. It is not nevertheless. The Lord speaks a word and we try to, well, but God. No, nevertheless. No, no. The word of God is the word of, the word of God. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified. They are very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land to the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up said, we are not able to go up against this people for they are stronger than we. And we have, we, uh, sorry, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, the land which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people uh, we saw in it are men of great stature. And we saw the giants, the descendants of Enoch. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and in their sight. Here's a group of people. Can I say this? Was God able to take them in? Could God have taken them? Was it theirs? It was theirs. But you see, they saw something that with their eyes and it nullified what God was trying to say to them. It stopped what God was saying. Let me just go on here. Our giants today are not 10 foot tall, 10 toed people or how many toed, 12 toes people. They're not fortified cities that cause us to fear and get intimidated, that stop us from entering into God's promise. 
Has anybody seen a giant lady? Anybody? No, they're not the things that stop us from going in, but we've got to understand what stops us, the church, in 2015 from going in and entering in and grabbing hold of and laying hold of all the promises that God has given to us and taking on the power and the authority that God said we would receive when we were filled with the Holy Spirit and go out and lay hands on the sick and see them recover and cast out devils and raise the dead. Go out and preach the gospel everywhere. You see, see what stops us, that's what we've got to look at today. What stops us from rising up and becoming this church that God is going to build? Because I want to tell you, hell's going to have to freeze over before it's going to happen if we don't rise up. We have to rise up, church. It's not just going to be something that's going to come from somewhere else. It's going to come with, from within the church. Today, uh, I believe that the, today it's, it's these afflictions that come against us. Although I, I read out quite a few. These afflictions, they've got a purpose. Their, their purpose is to try to strip away our courage. Strip away your courage. That's why when God spoke to, to, to uh, Joshua, He said, be courageous because He knew that the children of Israel had had their courage stripped away from them. This mighty army, this mighty people of God, this, this generation of people that, that had God with them. If God be for me, who can be against me? They had the presence of God. Now, why, why didn't they go in? Because their courage had been stripped from them. There's nothing left in them. They, they saw themselves the way that they shouldn't have seen themselves. So these things, these, these things that happened to us in the past, they try to strip away our courage. Like Israel, it, it immobilized them in their mind. Their minds, were, were, that's why the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 12 that we need to have our minds renewed. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know, that we might be able to prove what is that acceptable will of God? I want to tell you the will of God for your life and for my life is to be overcomers, to triumph, to become victorious, to be healed, to be delivered, to be blessed, to be everything that God said it could be. And if, if that's not being experienced in our lives, well, you and I have got the power of God within us to drive those things out. We've got to drive it out. You've got to drive insecurity out of your life. You've got to drive inferiority out of your life. You've got to drive fear out of your life. You've got to do something. You've got to break the strongholds. We, we, can, we can leave them there and, and go through life, die, go to heaven, but glory to God. God wants to have a church that's full of His power. Amen? Yes, amen. Hang on to your seat. Amen. You see, it, we, we've got to have this thing there in our minds, have your minds renewed. These afflictions are, are designed to nullify the Word of God. If you see that, you, the doctor says you, you've got six weeks to live and immediately people start preparing for their death. It nullified the Word of God that says, by your, my, my stripes you are healed. I'd rather go down fighting, amen? I'd rather have a go. Would you rather have a go? Rise up and start kicking that devil's butt. <laughs> it's okay to shout. Can I hear a shout here? Come on, hey. <laughs> hey it's okay to hear your voice. They're designed to, to nullify the Word of God. And people stop going in and they stop entering in. They make the circumstances that you're in bigger than they are and bigger than God. Is anything too hard for God? Is there anything too big for God? To make, they try to make you feel inferior in your mind and you think you're nothing but a grasshopper, a mere insect. You know what these things do? They block out your dreams and passions. They block out everything you are. They, can, they birth confusion and fear and double-mindedness. Self-esteem goes on a holiday and you're left with nothing. Just got a quote here. Courage 
is not the lack of fear. I want to say, friends, that every one of these things, as you face them, the first thing you'll face is fear. Fear will try to grip you and try to stop you from pursuing the enemy. Will try to stop you from getting rid of your inferiority or whatever it might be. Fear will, will grip you. But courage is not the lack of fear, but it's the master of it. Amen? It's the master of it. Amazing statement. Alexander the Great in his quest to rule the world, attacked King Porus of India. We've got to learn and, and do some things and find out how to smash the enemy. Alexander's army was 47,000 troops and 7,500 war horses. He set out to attack an army of 180,000 men and 200 war elephants. Here's a guy, he's going out. The battle was fought in the middle of the monsoon rain period. He had to cross a flooded river. All these horses, all these, all these troops. Uh, he had catapults, all this stuff. He had to cross a flooded river. He had to march miles to get to this place. How did he gain victory that day? By taking out Forrest's strengths. He had to take out the elephants and he had to take out the men's courage. When people start running, like today, if we allow the enemy to take away our strength, the mighty Holy Spirit, which the church has fallen prey to, we will be defenseless and a weaker army will overrun us. Friend, if there's ever a day we need a fresh Holy Ghost drenching, it's today. If ever there's a day we need the Holy Ghost power, yes. it's today. Yes. Amen? Amen? If we don't, we will be overrun yes. by a weaker enemy. How did he, how did he over, how did this one man, how did this, with this small army overcome? He looked at the strengths of the enemy. Each elephant had a trainer for life. One trainer. That elephant knew that one voice. These men were targeted by the most accurate archers and they were killed. Once that trainer was killed, the, the, the elephant had no voice to hear. Once we lose the Holy Ghost, we've got no voice to hear. We've got no unction. We've got, what have we got? Nothing. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the power of God. He took out these, elef he took out these trainers first. Now the elephants are running just willy-nilly. Then what he did was his archers that he had started to shoot at the eyes of the elephants and also at the soft underbelly of the elephants, causing them to run blindly, causing the pain of these things. They also had sharp uh, spears that they would jam into the stomachs of these elephants until they turned that 200 elephants and the elephants turned around and started to run towards their own troops. As they ran towards their own troops, the, the troops lost their courage because they saw their 200 uh, war elephants destroyed, uh, running now towards them hysterically in a mad rage. They ran in terror and Alexander took his 47,000 men in behind them. The gates were already opened and took that city. I want to tell you, that's what the devil is doing to the church. He's taking our power, the Holy Ghost power, Holy Ghost power. I need the Holy Ghost power. You will be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. Yes. Glory to God. I'm going to put that and make that at my sheet in my bed. <laughs> Turn them all around. Amen. Nancy's going to enjoy that. <laughs> Turn 
Today, churches are allowing homosexual pastors in their pulpits. I'm not just going to go into all this stuff, but there's so much rubbish where we've been overtaken by a weaker vessel. I believe that the enemy has been defeated. I believe that God has given us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of Satan. I believe that he's made us the head and not the tail. But nothing will change uh, till we change and allow the Holy Spirit to cause us to rise up. Romans 8, 31 says, we are, uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? I don't know what that one says. <laughs> yeah, if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 37 says we, that we are more than conquerors. Do you believe that? There was a movie there, a Persian army uh, attempted to intimidate and bring fear to a much smaller foe. This is what they said. The sky will be made black with our arrows. The smaller army with a grin replied, then we'll have to fight them in the shade. <laughs> then we'll have to fight them in the shade. What are we going to do, folks? What, what are we going to do? What, what will your answer be? What will our answer be to these things that rise up against us? To this, are we going to tackle it? Friend, I want to tell you, there's something happening in our prayer meetings of a Tuesday night as people gather together. There's something about joining together and, and praying in the Holy Ghost and starting to come against some of these things and break strongholds down and smash down walls. I, I believe we're in, a, in an amazing time. You know, I'll, I don't know who said this, Churchill, I think. It says, we'll fight them on the beaches. We'll fight them on the shores. We will never surrender. <laughs> hey, friends, how about we get a bit of backbone and a bit of tenacity, amen? How, how, about, how about we start to stand and declare? And, and the, you know, friend, you know, when we're praising God, how about, how about we just jump in and lift up our hands and sing as loud as we can? Why, why wait to be dragged into the presence of God? Why don't we just come in the presence of God, amen? Why don't, why don't we see some things starting to happen, some strategies happen? Don't, don't surrender to these light afflictions. Turn them around and push them back in amongst the enemy, amen? It, it, it's a time to fight. I, I believe that we, we've, got, we've got so much power we have more power in a fervent prayer of a righteous man to an almighty God that has defeated every devil that could ever be named. The children of Israel walked away in sorrow from God's gift and promise. And friend, to be honest with you, I, I, can, I, I try to read, as I read these scriptures and I, and I watch Joshua and Caleb as they, as they were there, as these people say, we're nothing but grasshoppers and we're this and we're that. We'll never be able to do it where there's fortified cities. Yeah, there, friend, I want to tell you, there's a war going on right now. We've got to brush through some stuff and knowing, but we fight from an advantage where we know that we wear, that, we, that the victor is already in us. Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. And, and that God has given us all power to overcome all the enemy. And, and as, as, as they were there and as the children of Israel are saying, when? And the Bible says that, that they turned away and they wept and they mourned. And I see too many people in the church turning away from the victory that's just across a little trickle, uh, uh, just another couple of steps, just a, uh, just a little bit more that we can just push through, push through, and it's there. But as, as the Holy Spirit's saying to us, come on, you can do it, come on, you can do it, come on. We hear the prophetic word week after week as God is encouraging us to go in and possess the land, go in and do this and go in and do that. But people, as, as a discouragement comes, disappointment comes, whatever it might be comes. They stand there, they look at the enemy, they think he's too big for us. It's, oh, it's too hard for me. My goodness, no, I want to tell you we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I want to tell you there's more for us and be against us. I want to tell you greater is he that dwells within me. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We are well able. 
We can do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever imagine or think. And, and the thing is that people, the church has got its head down weeping and we sing songs crying in the chapel. <laughs> Hold the fort for I am coming. (laughs) Glory to God. I want to tell you, God's coming back with a shout, but there's going to be a shout on planet earth when He comes back. Amen. There's going to be victory. There's going to be joy. There's going to be, I don't know, everything's going to be going. Amen. But the children, of they're they're walking back like this and they're saying, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And Joshua and Caleb rose up and says, come on, come on, let's go in. We are able to possess the land. I want to be a Joshua and a Caleb. I don't say, come on, rise up. We are well able to go in and possess the land. Why? Because God has given it to us. Not because of global connections or because assemblies of God or some other thing. (laughs) God has given us a victory. Go in and possess our bit, amen? Take what God has given for us. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Let us be that people. Let us be that people. God's going to do it. Uh, you know, 40, 40 years later, Joshua and Caleb went in and possessed the land. It was, they could have taken it 40 years ago. You know what? There's a lot of things we could have taken some time ago, but I'm not going to, re, going to get upset because I didn't have it last week. I'm going to just take it this week. <laughs> because I didn't take it last year, I'm going to have it this week. Amen. Because I didn't have it 10 years ago, I'm going to take it this week. Amen. Why don't we do that? How about we rise to our feet today? Why don't we stand to our feet in Jesus' name? Let us be that that people that go in and possess the promises of God. I'm coming into the promises of God, the full release of His power, the church in victory. Praise God. That's what I believe. I don't know about you.